Vulcan has also been collecting these data, um, and then some of it is what's been published, or in other words, what's in the medical literature. So we've tried, in other words, what I've tried to do is take every piece of information from anywhere that it's available, synthesize it together, and give it back to you. It's not perfect. You're going to see, I'll tell you, at the end, there's still a lot of gaps in what we know, but at least it's the best data that I know of, timestamp it today, in terms of August 2018. But we still have a lot to learn. Okay. As we're doing it, for those of you who are online, um, this is also representing your data, it's approximately equally males and females. That's to be expected. This is an equal opportunity, and as you'll see in a second, equal opportunity in every way. Males, females, young, old, United States, China, Europe, I'm sure it's actually relatively equal prevalence around the world. But what's different is most people on this planet that have this don't know they have it. Right? So you guys are the exception to the rule. You guys that are here online are actually just the tip of the iceberg in terms of people who now know that they belong to this club. One of the things we need to do is actually make our club bigger. And so we'll talk about that at the end. Okay. And I won't go over it again, but just to remind folks that in terms of some of the issues you've heard about in terms of having kids, if you still have questions, you want to clarify them, we can talk about them on the panel discussion. But really, any risk in terms of this happening again lies mostly for the individual who has the over 4 syndrome. Right? So just as a very brief presentation. So like I said, and I should say um, that the slides that I'm showing you mostly go to the credit in terms of Vulcan who's put this together and then the Simon's VIP team. I just get the pleasure of being able to talk to you guys, but really they're the ones who did all the hard work. Um, in terms of where the data are coming from, as I, I don't know if you can see this, and all of this is going to be available both online, so anything I'm saying is going to be, the videotape's going to be online, um, all the slides themselves you can have access to, so don't feel like you have to write down furiously to take notes. You're, you can have any of this. Um, this is showing you globally where all the cases are that we know of, and as you'll see in just a second in sort of higher resolution, <coughs> it is mostly in the United States and in Western Europe. Okay? It's not because this happens to be something that only white folks get. It just happens to be that that's where this is being identified. I will tell you one of the things I work very hard at is to try and make sure that around the world we are actually spreading this information. So for instance, in September, I will be in China trying to make sure that we can find more of the cases that are in China um, and trying to liaison to put all of our collective brain power together on this. Um, and the reason I mentioned China specifically is you probably realize there are a whole lot of people in China and India and other parts of the world, so we have a lot to learn from each other. So as I said, and hopefully some of you are online, uh, we also have large numbers in Europe. Um, this is, I, I know these in particular as being places where there are a lot of geneticists and where places that have been adopting genetic testing, and that's where we see these centers around. It's not, I don't think, again, because this happens to be uh, a Dutch condition or a German condition, um, but that happens to be where they've done more adopting of this type of technology. Quickly through this. Um, so this is um, in terms of some of the numbers. For Simon's VIP, um, for the portion that came in through that, there are only seven individuals registered. And I'm not here to call people out, but I do want to show you the limitations in terms of the numbers. And I'll explain why I'm saying this a little bit later. I do want to call out the age distribution, though. So as you can see, for the individuals in Simon's VIP, we are still a young uh, a young community. And so what I mean by that is many of you will ask me questions about long term, what do things look like when my young person gets to be in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and I'm going to tell you I do not know. And it's not that I'm holding anything back from you, I'm not trying to be coy, we just don't know. And so that is one of the things we are going to have to work on. Okay. Um, I'll show you this in a slightly different way. Um, but this is what we were getting into uh, just a few minutes ago in terms of the different types of changes we can see in the gene. And again, all of this is going to be available to you. So there are 
many of you actually have different changes in the gene. So if you were to compare your genetic test reports to each other, you would see, hopefully, as a commonality, that this gene is at least one of the genes involved um, in terms of what's going on. But this is actually showing by the different uh, locations, the different addresses within the genes, and I'll show you another picture of this in a second. Um, there are different differences in terms of where they are located. There are two that we tend to see more commonly. And there's nothing, I'm not saying no offense or nothing special, um, uh, but there are two that we see more commonly. And as we were talking about, because these are more common, they are the two that we have decided to make the mouse models on to get started. And we did this simply because, as I said, they were more common. And we were wondering, was there anything special about them? Eventually, it is likely that we will need to get to have more, sort of more variety in terms of what we're doing. But I also want to tell you that if you're one of these singletons, uh, what I call you know the one and lonely for right now, you may not be one and lonely forever, but it is especially important for you to participate in the research and do things like giving blood samples, because otherwise there is going to get be no way to get your information represented. You have to do it for yourself if you're one of these folks, because there is no one to make up for you. If you're one of these folks, you may be able to convince your neighbor or someone else to pick up the slack for you, but if you're one of these folks, you gotta do it on your own. Okay, so this is just a very similar representation to what you saw in terms of where the different changes are in the gene. Let me just make a couple little points that may not have been clear from earlier presentations. What I've shown as the bar along the bottom is that there are some individuals who actually are missing either the entire gene or a large portion of the gene or even this gene and a couple neighboring genes, okay? Those folks are actually very, very valuable for us to understand what's going on because we think the mechanism or we think the way this gene is working is that it's not working. So in other words, we think of it as being a loss of function or being able to lose this. Now, the reason this is important, and I won't go deep into the weeds, but many of these other differences that we see here, biochemically, we make guesses that they're loss of function or that they're also a result of not having that particular kinase working, but we need to do the hard work of biochemically showing that. And this is, I have to admit, a lot of work. So each single one of these that you see, each one of these single addresses and positions, for the most part, actually has to be interrogated independently. And so it gets to be a lot of, this gene, unlike some other genes that we've seen, we really are going to have a wealth of riches, a wealth of opportunities, but also a lot of hard work because it's so diverse in terms of the different places that we see the gene being affected. I'll, I'll tell you one of the punchlines because I know you've been asking, there could be, I, my sense from talking to you guys, and part of the reason we're all here today is to compare notes, my sense is that there are more similarities in the group than differences. You'll tell me if I'm wrong at the end of the weekend, but that's my sense. And so my sense is that most of these changes are about the same, but importantly, there may be some differences within the group. And part of what we're trying to figure out is what is that pattern in the group, what seems to be the same and consistent, and who are the outliers, who are different, and then to put that back with the biochemistry to understand at a very specific molecular level, how is the kinase working in those cases differently, potentially. And the reason we're doing this at the end of the day is because you're asking questions like, so what do I do? How do I prepare? How do I prevent problems in the future? And we need to try and get our heads around it by understanding at the genetic level, are there certain of these that seem to be more severe, less severe, acting in a different way? But we've got a lot of work to do. Okay, so with this, um, just to show you, and again, um, the two that we're seeing that are the most common, one of them is over here, K198R, and then the other one is over here. We actually see two different changes, but both at amino acid 47. And again, you'll see that there are different parts of the gene. Just to highlight a couple other things that I know you just saw, these little blocks that we've colored in are ones that we think are more important in terms of how the, the, the protein functions. But I also have to say, I myself am wondering, because we also have a couple of these that are in positions that are not the most conserved regions, and I frankly don't know why they're there. I mean, 
And these are still some unanswered questions. And we haven't, I don't think at least I haven't come up with ideas about biochemically how those are working. So we still have, as I said, a lot of unanswered questions. Okay, I'm going to start the description from the beginning of the journey. So as we were asking you all questions in terms of what you reported was different, and some of you have other children, so you can think back and compare. Um, these are based on 39 individuals now. So again, as I said, either from Simon's VIP, <coughs> individuals that uh, Vulcan has talked with, individuals in the literature, but now it's based on 39 individuals. I will tell you, to me, 39 is a decent number, but it's still not a huge number, right? Especially when we think about we're still mostly children that we're talking about with this. Okay. Number one, and I think this was the one that many, especially I have to give credit to the moms on this one, I think many of you realized very early on there was just something different about your baby. The tone was different, they just felt a little bit looser, not quite as strong. Um, I think that was the, for many of you, the sort of aha moment. Some of you noticed in terms of latching on, feeding and sucking uh, and eating from the very beginning that things were a little bit slower, maybe not as strong. Um, and for some of you, they just that your kids from a behavioral point of view just seem to be a little different, either a little sleepier or a little bit more irritable. Um, the next thing many of you noticed, and I think at the beginning it wasn't necessarily, that wasn't the time you brought it to the attention of the pediatrician right away, but over time when you started, you know, those your baby books, you know, when you would write down when they first started sitting up and walking, taking their first steps, taking saying their first words. I think for many of you, it became very apparent uh, when you're, the, we call them milestones, but when we put those things in the baby books, uh, when some of those things seem to be happening later. Um, I do want to emphasize they happen later, but for the most part, they happen, right? So for those of you who especially have younger children, it takes time. <coughs> Be patient. Don't give up. Don't get frustrated. We have to do things to support our young people, but they happen for the most part, okay? So when do they happen? And I say this because this may be something that other families watch later down the road. I know most of you have already been through this, but this is mostly for those other folks in the future. Uh, walking was happening about two years of age. First words were coming in a little after two years of age. And then in terms of potty training or toilet training, again, sort of toddler years uh, or preschool years in terms of that. The thing that we see most commonly, in fact, I would say universally across everyone, are issues that have to do with the brain and behavior, right? So everyone has some challenges in this dimension, but they're variable in terms of how severe. So everyone, 43 out of 43, have had problems in terms of what I call developmental delays or intellectual disabilities. So this is a common feature that we see across everyone. Many people worry about a condition called autism. So in other words, issues, and when I say autism, what I mean is individuals who have difficulty sometimes with social, socially interacting with other people, sometimes feeling overwhelmed, what we call sensory overload, or getting overwhelmed in new situations and by loud noises or lots of visual stimulation. Um, and a restricted interest, being interested in a relatively narrow scope of things. Those are the things, when I say autism, that's what I mean. So, about a quarter of individuals in our group either have an official diagnosis of autism, someone has officially said they have autism, or people said they had autistic-like behaviors or features. May not have officially met criteria, um, but they seem to be on the spectrum. And so um, this is also, I want to point out though, that this does not mean that they're not very friendly, lovable, happy, upbeat individuals, right? So this can be, you can, either have those features and still be a very sort of happy person, um, or even potentially very friendly. So, so some of these, I know it sounds like they might not be the same, um, but you can see both of those. Language is an almost, I would say, universal, and I actually think it probably is universal, um, but at least from what was reported, almost universal feature. One of the things, and again, I think I tell this mostly for people who might have younger children, is that it doesn't, just because the words are not coming out, doesn't mean the thoughts are not happening, right? And so in terms of receptive language, receptive language, understanding, processing the information, actually is doing much, much better than the time it takes to literally get the words out of the mouth, right? 
So for any of you that are still at the stage where your children are not speaking, or it's not very clear, they have some problems with motor planning, apraxia, their speech feels garbled, you can't really get it out, do not give up, right? It will happen, it takes time, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of work with the speech therapist, and until then, and I will point out, this is controversial, and I'll tell you my opinion on this, is that for individuals who are not just speaking with their mouths, it's okay for them to speak with their hands, it's okay for them to speak with their tablets and their communication devices. It is important, though, that they be able to express themselves so they don't get frustrated, and so mainly that we can understand their thoughts, we can communicate. And there are many ways of communication. So it doesn't all have to be simply by words coming out of the mouth. But where we can, we want to get them so that they can communicate as easily as possible with as many people as possible, okay? So like I said, that's somewhat controversial because some of your speech therapists, some of your speech pathologists will say, absolutely, I will not use a communication board. I don't want to go there um, because they want to force people to learn to speak. I might not be as dogmatic about that. I'm not a speech and language pathologist. I will warn you about that. Um, but do talk to do talk at least and have a discussion about that. Um, we've already talked about a little bit about that sleep problems can be an issue for some of you. I'd love to drill down in terms of that a little bit more um, in terms of things that have been working, melatonin, other things that may be stronger medications in terms of that. Um, but these are all related to the brain. It's again about a cycle, a 24-hour cycle, what we call a circadian cycle with that. I also want to point out, because kids are different ages, there are some behaviors that become more obvious at different life stages. I find personally, and again, remember that I said that most of these kids are young, we saw 12 out of the kids where their parents reported they had attention problems. I actually think it may be higher than that, but mainly because it becomes more obvious as the kids get older. So more into adolescence, more into young adults, and there's a relatively easy way to deal with this, which is just don't try and do too many things at one time, right? In terms of distractibility, problems attending, it may mean that you do more focus, focus on one thing for a shorter period of time and taking more breaks in terms of that. But I will warn you in terms of that, within our current world that we live in and our current technology, we are doing more multitasking, but our kiddos with this may have more challenges with Right? So, so keep that in mind in terms of what they need to do to focus and to attend. Okay, I'm going to switch gears for a second and now go to some of the medical issues. And I'm putting these and I'm going to try and highlight things that you should be doing, either monitoring or paying attention to. And you are more than welcome to give this slide deck to your doctors or any of the therapists in terms of what they should be doing. Rule number one for me is that to be able to learn, for the brain to be able to work well, you have to have all the communication channels coming into the brain completely clear and working well. What does that mean practically? It means your eyes have to be working to take in all of the sight, and it means your ears have to be working to hear things as clearly as possible. Okay. For our kiddos, they do have slightly increased problems with the eyes. I think that's just what this is part of in terms of what they're born with. It doesn't mean they're blind, it doesn't mean they're gonna go blind, but it means that we need to help them with this so that they can see the world around them. For some of them, they may have a lazy eye or they may have crossed eye. That's something that sometimes needs a minor surgical procedure. In general, if that's the case for your child, go with it. Do not hold them back in terms of doing this. We wanna be on the aggressive side in terms of making sure we have those channels coming in correctly. For the most part, um, in terms of glasses, these are something that you need to continue monitoring for. It's not just like you look at this when your baby's born and if it's not there, you're done. For the vision and the hearing, you need to continually reassess this to make sure that if your child needs to sit at the front of the room, if they need to have glasses to see clearly, you're <coughs> constantly getting that checked up. It's rare, but I am, there are two things that I want to keep my eye on and I want you guys to tell us about in terms of cataracts and retinal dystrophy. These are things that may require slightly different either surgery to repair the cataracts, and the retinal dystrophy is something that I don't 
completely have my head around yet, but it's important for us all as a community to keep an eye on that. And if we see that, if the doctors, the eye doctors tell us about it, that we share that within the community. To look at this, it does mean that the eye doctor will have to do a dilated exam. So they have to put the drops in the eyes to get a good look at the back of the eyes. I know this isn't the easiest thing to do, but it's important. So in terms of the things to do, important, and I'll, I'll explain, I'm going to have sort of a checklist of things I think the family should do, but seeing the eyes are an important thing to do on an annual basis in terms of getting that check. Okay? The other is, as I said, for the ears. Um, this is not necessarily most babies, at least in the United States, get their hearing checked at birth, but that's not enough especially if your child has had problems with multiple ear infections or fluid in the ears, it's important to be, again, on the aggressive side about putting tubes in the ears to drain that fluid out, make sure they're not hearing as if they're underwater. Because if you have a lot of fluid in your ears, it's if you're going swimming and you're underwater, and you know how you hear this like garbled stuff, you know, that you can't really hear people clearly? That's what your hearing is like if you've got lots of fluid in your ears. So those are things we want to keep a close eye on. Again, in terms of some of the things that we saw um, from the neurological side, not that there's um, anything that you're going to do necessarily about some of these, but just to realize muscle tone tends to be low. So it's something that many of you, if you have individualized education plans, have physical therapy as part of that, that's a good thing to do. Help the tone, help the trunkal tone especially. Um, smaller head size is something that's seen in about a quarter of the children. The main thing is I don't want you to panic. Right? So if the doctor does one of these things where they do a tape measure around the head and the head size seems to be smaller, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't panic. They're, you know, you're not going to do anything about it, but just to know that that's an issue. Some of the kiddos have issues in terms of what I call movement problems, motor planning problems, or coordination. So it's the type of thing where they tend to be clumsier. And it tends to be when they're doing gym, as an example, they're not necessarily the star athletes on the team. Okay. So with that, when you're doing your physical therapy, when the therapist is helping, or when you're even just playing in the backyard, you may need to spend some extra time practicing taking a soccer ball, throwing a frisbee, um, shooting a basketball in the basketball hoop, things that are fun and can be fun, but it takes a lot more practice. And if that's important for your child or your family, you just need to know you're going to need to do a little bit more practice there. Okay. One of the medical things, though, that is real important, so this is one of these asterisk things, if you're taking notes, put a star by this one, is seizures. The good thing is that there are certain conditions that have seizures, seizures, seizures as a lot. My, my impression so far, this is not one of those conditions that's predominated by seizures, that's all about seizures. But seizures can happen. And it's very important that if seizures do happen, that they get treated with medication if it's necessary. If seizures are going on and you don't know about it and they're not being treated, it's like having an electrical thunderstorm in your head and you cannot think clearly when that's going the on. The doctor and does cannot well. learn clearly when that's going on. So if you are seeing anything that, you look like, that looks like a seizure, and I'll tell you what that is in a second, if you have a phone, a smartphone, if you have your wits about it when it happens, I want you to take a movie of that, and I want to take that to your doctor, your pediatrician, your neurologist, whoever your doctor, your go-to person is, but I want you to show that to them and ask them if they think it looks like a seizure. And if they are worried that it might be, my recommendation is they bring your child into the hospital and do a 24-hour video EEG. So that's where they come into the hospital, they have a camera that's looking at your child, and at the same time, they have electrodes on the brain that are looking at the electrical activity. And that way, if they see any of those same behaviors on the camera, they will look at the EEG tracing at the same time and see if there's that electrical thunderstorm going on. So what are the types of things that might be a seizure? If you see, and it can be subtle, if you see that your child tends to just have this blank stare on their face and you can't bring them out of it, that could be something that we call a small seizure, a petty small seizure. It's sometimes very difficult to tell. Sometimes it looks like daydreaming because that's you know what it actually looks like. And sometimes it is just daydreaming. 
It's not necessarily a seizure. So I know that's very nerve-wracking. Is this a seizure? Or are they just, you know, sort of taking a, a sort of mental nap? You're not sure? Take a videotape of it. And like I said, if you need to, you can have your neurologist or your pediatrician decide whether or not to do an EEG. There's sometimes when they might do a little bit of eye twitching. They might even do a little bit of what we call lip smacking, or the corner of their mic mouth start, might start to wiggle. So it can be something relatively subtle, but you'll see a small, fine movement somewhere in the face. That's another thing that you might see, and it may not last very long. But that's more indicative of a seizure, because that tends not to happen just in terms of uh, just accidentally sort of happening. And then the final thing that becomes much more obvious is if they start doing some jerking movements, either of the arm or the leg, or even all of those in terms of the arms and the legs. For any of those, if there's a period afterwards where your child seems not to be responding, they seem to be very tired, very lethargic, they take a nap, that's another thing that we worry about in terms of being a seizure. So if you're seeing those red flags coming up, I urge you be on the side of being cautious in terms of getting that checked out. Okay. Some of the other things that we saw with slightly less frequency were issues around just intestinal issues. Some issues were around feeding, some issues were around reflux. None of these were what I would call, for the most part, um, really severe problems, but we did have a couple of kiddos that needed to have a tummy tube, so what we call a gastrostomy tube, feeding them into their stomachs. Um, so these can be some things that we see. For the most part, though, one of the things I want to emphasize is that we do know that our children tend to be more petite. They tend to be shorter. They tend to be smaller. And so you, when you're thinking about looking at those growth charts, you know, your pediatrician every time goes and they say, how tall are they? How much do they weigh? Because they tend to be shorter, one of the things I want them to do is actually look at the weight or the height. Right? So I want you to look, I want them to look at that proportion. If the proportion is good, I'm good. If they're too skinny, if they're too fat, then that's where we've got an issue. But they have a way that the pediatricians, and they know how to do it. If you just remind them and say, I want you to plot the weight or the height, you'll know that if they are too skinny, then we need to do figure out ways of being able to get more nutrition into them. Okay? And there are ways, there are tricks we have of doing this. Many of you know that we can do things in terms of shakes, nutrition shakes, to be able to do this. All the things that you and I want to eat for dinner but can't, they can. Um, so, you know, all the ice cream, butter, all of those things are, are some ways that we get more calories in. Okay, in terms of infections, for the most part, these were not a big issue. And so, although you'll see some things on here, I want to emphasize I did not have any evidence that the children have immunodeficiencies, that is that their immune system is not working. What I tend to see, and again, you guys tell me if you see the same, is that sometimes they're the first in the family to get sick and the last to get well, or it seems like things linger on in terms of uh, colds or ear infections or stomach bugs, but they will eventually get over them. The issue is that when they're down, they're oftentimes not eating well, they're not doing well in terms of learning and participating in their therapies, so they can sometimes stall out in terms of growing, and sometimes they can stall out temporarily in terms of their development and being able to move forward with their learning. So we try as much as possible to limit the number of infections. We know we don't want to keep them in a bubble, so we know it's not going to be perfect, but we want to limit the number of infections because we don't want to hold them back. What are some practical things you can do? Purell is your friend. Right? So Purell, keep one of those little you know, travel size ones, keep it on your purse, on your backpack, whatever it is. When you can and you're going out, be a germaphobe and use Purell when you can. And immunizations are also your friend. So in terms of making sure the kids are up to date with all of their vaccines, every year getting the flu vaccine, that means not just your child, but it means everyone in the family. You're going to try and use what we call herd immunity. You're going to try and make sure everyone around them is being prevented from getting these infections but keep minimizing the number of infections is a good thing. In terms of, uh, I've called this endocrine issues, but the main problem is really, as I said, around growth. I know some of you have been wondering, uh, should we use growth hormone? Is growth hormone gonna be useful for this? I will just tell you, I don't know the answer. Um, in general, for genetic conditions like this, the children don't have a growth hormone deficiency. So in other words, if their body is still producing the growth hormone, 
Um, and in general, if you were to give them growth hormone, and just so you know, I'm not advertising that you all now run home and get growth hormone, but if you were to use growth hormone, I do think the children would grow. I think their bodies respond to the growth hormone, but I don't know how much they would grow and how much different that would be than if we just let them alone and wait and see how tall they were when they're 20 years old. So it's very much an unanswered question. Um, for those of you who either do have your child on growth hormone or started, and I'll say this as a general rule for everything, we should share our experience to find out what's working and what's not, because we don't know the answers to these questions, and we've got to answer them together. We do know, and this comes mainly in terms of when the children are doing their therapies, some of them can be a little looser and can be a little bit hypermobile. It's not to the degree that I see that they're dislocating every joint, but it can be to the degree that when they're trying to do their therapies, the muscle tone is just a little bit lower, they can have a little trouble in terms of their knees buckling or their ankles twisting. Um, the therapists, I think, do a very good job with this, but it is one of the things we can see. And one of the things I'm watching longer term, for those of you who have children with hip dysplasia, uh, those types of orthopedic issues, we do need to be careful about checking early so that they don't have orthopedic problems once they get much older. Um, so I don't think it happens very frequently, but we should uh, uh, look at that. Um, in terms of bony issues, these don't happen very often, but remember your children are still for the most part young. We have seen a couple issues in terms of the skull. These are things that you would see. Your doctor would see just by looking at your child, so I don't think you need to go looking for any of those. They're either there or not there by now. But one of the things that can change over time is scoliosis. In particular, during puberty, when kids are growing rapidly, is one of the times that they're at risk to have curvature of the spine or scoliosis. And so do make sure your pediatricians are checking every single year, starting to when the kids get to be double digits, so 10 and older, and just have them, they bend over at the doctor's office, look at the spine and make sure things are lining up correctly. I don't yet know, but we have seen a few cases of the, the vertebrae, the bones in the, in the spine, being slightly abnormally shaped. And when that happens, the kids are at higher risk for scoliosis. I don't yet know whether all the kids should just automatically be getting an x-ray of the spine to see whether or not they have that, but it is one of the questions I have for you guys, because I think once we have an idea of how many of the kiddos have had x-rays of the back, we'll know how frequent this is and whether or not we need to have everyone get x-rays to look at the bones in the back. So some other issues that are relatively minor, but some of you have noted already, is we do see a slightly higher percentage of what I call um, skin, hair, and tooth issues. So none of these are life-threatening uh, by any means, but I think it's some of the things that you've noticed. Some of the children have finer hair, um, in particular compared to family members. Some do have slight differences of the nails, and some have had problems with more cavities. And the more cavities, I'm not sure yet whether it's a problem with the covering of the teeth that prevents against cavities, or whether it's problems in terms of being able to get in there and, and really be able to brush and floss. Uh, but I will say that we've seen a little bit more of this. As we get more information, one of the things you can do, though, is with your dentist, there are sealants they can put on the teeth, especially on the molars in the back, the teeth in the back, a layer of protection against cavities, um, and that may be something that we'll want to do. I think I, we still need a little bit more data to see, but it's something I'm hoping you're keeping an eye on. Um, there are a couple structural things that we see within the body. Again, I don't think we're seeing it with very high frequency, but we do need to gather data to know whether or not this is something we systematically need to do for everyone. We do see a slightly higher percentage of individuals with structural heart disease. Um, I don't yet know, as I said, if this is really only seven out of, it's not seven out of 43 because everyone hasn't had an echocardiogram yet, but this is one of these things that I think if you get one echocardiogram and it's normal, I think that's the only thing you'll need to do. So in other words, unlike the eyes and the ears, I don't think you have to do it time and time again. We just need to see once that the heart is okay and then cross that off the list if it is. In the same thing we've seen, again, it's a low frequency, but seeing things with the kidneys and the way the kidney collects to the bladder. So what we call genitourinary uh, differences, the plumbing of the bladder, what we call the ureters, hydronephrosis, um, and slight structural differences in that. And again, it's a very easy thing to either do an 
an ultrasound of the heart or an ultrasound of the kidneys and the bladder. There's no radiation involved. It's not as no anesthesia involved. Um, and so this may be something that we'll need to look at more carefully in individuals to see exactly how frequent it is. Um, at this point, several people, about half of the individuals, have had pictures of the brain, so what we call MRIs of the brain. There have been some differences, but there are not things that have required any surgical treatments at this point. And so at least at this point, my recommendation is let's collect all the data that we can. But if your child would require sedation to have an MRI of the brain, right now I don't see that that's worthwhile. So in other words, I would not want to put your child under sedation just to get a picture of the brain. But if they have had a picture of the brain, let's put all of it together so we can see if, in fact, this is the right frequency that we should, and the right recommendation that we should make. In terms of the different types of surgeries that the uh, young people have had, to me, this is good news that we don't see a large number of surgeries. And if you look across the different types of surgeries, there's not anything that's jumping out as a large number of individuals that all require the same type of surgery. So the good news, remember they're young, but the good news to me is it doesn't look like there's something that we're seeing that needs a lot of repair, a lot of surgical intervention. Keep in mind this is a very small number here because this comes from the Simon's VIP data, but it also in terms of the number of individuals where their condition has been so severe that it required medicine, it hasn't been the majority of individuals. This is one of the areas that in particular, because it's still a small number, I think is a good place for us to focus in terms of collecting data. Um, because again, if it's severe enough to need medication, it's sort of more significant to me than if it's something that doesn't, uh, isn't significant enough to require medicines for. Okay, so just briefly to sum up, I want to put it all on one slide for you. Again, there are, some there are some issues in terms of when things happen developmentally, how they happen, what it takes to support folks, but it happens. Um, I'll get into it in just a second, but I do think one of the most important things is to make sure that you've got a good IEP or individualized education plan, that you've got good teachers in your school system, you've got good therapists to be able to support the way in which your young person learns and to make sure that they're very practical in terms of what the learning goals are. Within all of this, there are some medical issues. I can't say there are none, but they tend not to be life-threatening medical issues, and there tend to be things that we can deal with. So I don't think this is going to be dominated by a lot of medical disabilities long-term, a lot of hospitalizations, a lot of surgeries. I think mainly this is going to end up being something that'll be something to deal with from an educational point of view, and the one place to put these together, right where I have it here, is with the seizures. I do want to make sure seizures are something that you're monitoring for. Seizures, eyes, and ears. Okay, so. So, I wrote this, uh, in fact, this morning as I was sitting here, um, as guidelines because I wanted something for your doctors to have the punchline. Your doctors, I know, are very busy. They oftentimes don't want to listen to me with 30 or 60 minutes telling them what to do. So this is the place where you should tell them to focus, right? For you and your doctors, this is where we, we've talked about already, but I put it here together as just one slide that you can give them. If you can only get them to read one thing, this is one of the things you can get them to read. Um, and I hope this will um, sort of know where to focus their attention. Um, I just want to mention this one thing also for you guys. I think you have already learned this, um, but to be able to um, I think the children do best when they know what to expect and when they don't have surprises. So to the extent that you can, having a routine, when you change the routine as much as you can, talking them through what those changes are going to be, give as much lead time as you can about them, even show them pictures. I thought Jennifer did a great job in terms of the social story for the meeting here. Um, but being able to literally make it very concrete for them and what to anticipate helps a lot in terms of being able to prepare for those situations. So, what's the problem with what I told you today about today? I did the best I could. Vulcan actually is the one that I picture give the credit to. Vulcan did the best he could in terms of putting all of this together, but it is still based on, for us, very small amounts of information. So, for those of you who are scientific, they have very wide confidence intervals. In other words, I am not 100% confident of everything I told you about, but my spirit, and you can disagree with me, my spirit is that we should work together, and I should tell you as much as I know, and you're just as uncertain or certain as I am, but we're all in this together. 
So how can we get better though? We need to fill our gaps in our knowledge. In our knowledge. One of the biggest questions you've heard about this morning, and I will reiterate it, is that I don't know that everyone with, this, with a different mutation applies equally this information. There may be some differences. There may be some subtle differences. There may be some big differences. I just don't know. So we need to be able to put that information together, and we will start doing everything from the very basic biochemistry to some of the mouse models to what we see as these kids are growing up, and we'll compare all of those things. There are a bunch of these other things that practically I don't know the answer to, but if you were trying some things, I want to, we want to, this is an experiment that's being done just out there, um, we will need to gather the data together. Will growth hormone work? Like I said, I don't know. If someone tries it, if someone is on it, let's, let's try and put our heads together and collect the data. Exactly what is the risk of seizures in the future, particularly for me during puberty? Again, I don't know. That's the honest answer. But puberty is a time when the body is changing. Hormonally, there could be changes with changes in the brain. So it is a time where if your child has not yet gone through adolescence and puberty, just pay special attention there. I don't want to freak you out, but pay special attention. Are there other challenges with puberty beyond things like scoliosis? Again, for the most part, I don't know, but let's put our heads together. And a huge issue, which I think we have close to no data on, or what do we do when our kids get to be adults? Are there future risks of, I hope, and I don't think there are future risks of cancer, but are there future risks of diabetes, of heart disease, autoimmune disease, anything else? I have no idea. Um, and so as our kids are growing up, we need to share that information and give it to each other. At the end of the day, I know one of the things that you guys worry deeply about is how independent is my young person going to be? Are they going to be able to get a job? Are they going to be able to live alone? Are they going to have a family, have their own kids? Um, I'll tell you the one thing about this is, is that I actually am very hopeful that the time we live in now has a lot of technologies and a lot of supports that weren't available when I was growing up. And so there are a lot of opportunities to help our kids be the best that they can be. And so as a community, and I don't know if any of you either here today or online out there, some of you are actually going to be the people developing the technologies and the supports that are going to help all of us in terms of doing this. So either develop it, find it, share it, uh, do whatever we do. But as there are little problems that come up, let's think creatively about how to solve those problems. We don't have to do it all by just simply drill and learning our times tables. Um, in fact, for any of you, I think I've told a couple of you, I care very little about long division for your kids, right? I have, a, I have a calculator on my phone. We can spend a you know, we can easily punch the numbers in to do long division. Um, I wouldn't spend a lot of my energy in terms of that type of work. Okay, another thing that I don't know the answer to, and I don't know that it'll be a big deal, um, but I don't know if we're going to be able to do this in terms of just treatment with educational strategies, therapies. Is there going to be a medication that we can use? Is there going to be a pill that we can use to be able to make this better? If there is, what's the window of opportunity for doing that? Is it going to be just until our kids hit the age of 20, the age of 2? I don't know. I really have no idea about this. Um, but as we do this, I hope for the best, but I also prepare for the worst. The worst to me is not so bad, but I prepare for the possibility that none of this is available. And what can we do in terms of educational strategies, therapy strategies, make sure that our kids are as prepared as possible, that if one of these breakthroughs comes through, that we are ready to be able to enable them for that. So how do we start getting the answers? Um, we've got to do this together. We've got to do this in a rigorous way. We can't just do this anecdotally by sharing stories. I want to emphasize we need to do this scientifically and rigorously uh, to make sure that what we're telling each other are actually the right answers. You guys do this 24-7. And because you do, you have a huge amount of information, a huge amount of experience, but also some of you and record this information or have recorded this information, and we need to actually have a systematic way as a community of being able to collect and share that information. We want to protect your privacy, so this is not about putting out you know, all of your information for everyone in the world to see. We can do this in a way that's de-identified, that protects your information, but we need to be able to do this. There are many more of us out there that are in this room and online today, and we need to be able to find those people. And many of those that are most valuable are actually not our little folks, but our older folks. And so for anyone that wants to, we can do this in the panel discussion or later, but we need to be able to find those adults that are out there and learn from what their experience has been. We 
because they are in the generation ahead of us that will help inform us for what we need to be careful about. Um, as we do this, and this is especially true, as I said, because the different families have different mutations, um, we're here today to collect blood samples. As you've heard about, there are also experiments in terms of collecting skin samples. But as we make these different cellular models, you have to represent yourself. If you don't represent yourself, I can't necessarily ensure that we're going to study your family mutation. You've got to dig in. You've got to do it. We have tried to make it as easy as possible for you to participate. Like I said, we have, and I will tell you, for any of you who are giving blood today uh, in terms of doing this, I brought the best of the best phlebotomists in the world to be able to draw blood on you and your kids. I kid you not. I paid a very pretty price to be able to have the very best ladies be able to do this. They are gentle. They are amazing. They have 35 years of experience between them doing this. They will do a good job, but you have to be willing to do this. So if you can do your part, and if you don't want to, I'm not going to pressure you. It's not, you know, I'm not going to wrestle you to the ground to do this. But we have tried to make this as easy as possible for those of you who are here in the room. And for those of you who are online, we also have options to be able to do this other places. So again, we are meeting you at least halfway in terms of doing this. The mantra of everything that I personally do, I can't say this is true of everyone in the research world, but for anyone that I represent, Dr. Orkor, myself for sure, anything that we gather, whether it's information about your kiddos, whether it's these blood samples, skin samples, we do to make available to the entire research community. So we do not have a monopoly on this. We make sure that any researcher, they have to be a real researcher, but any researcher can get the information without knowing who you are, so your identity is safe within all of this, but enables you to contribute to the research one time and have it reach many, many people around the globe who can all think together and be able to help solve the problem. And I think that's very important for you all to respect your time and your contribution. So as we're doing this, I just wanted to make sure you knew how to get in touch with us. Dr. Lacour and myself, our email addresses are up here. We'd love to hear from you. Um, do uh, remind us, um, and I will warn you in advance, if I say that I will do something for you here at this meeting, I promise I will do it. But you have to help me, but you have to send me an email to remind me what I told you I would do because I will undoubtedly let something slip through the cracks otherwise. So as I said, our hearts are in it. We want to do what we can to support you and the families. Um, but send us a reminder. And as you go through this journey, um, even if you don't ever come back to another family meeting, we are still here to support you and to answer your questions. Tell us your insights, the things that you see that just really sort of stick out at you as something that puzzles you, makes you wonder, that maybe that you've seen with another family. Tell us about those things. Because I can tell you that I learn more from you than I do from the rest of us. <coughs> you guys are my data in terms of helping us guide us to what's important and focus our attention on the things that you care about. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. And I think we've got, we're going to go. we got to go to lunch. Got to go to lunch. I'm sorry. I, I blabbered.